Hi, this is Derek C. Moss, Professor of English and Interdisciplinary Studies at SUNY Potsdam. Welcome to A Deeper Dive into African American Literature, a daily series of short podcasts produced in conjunction with SUNY Potsdam's Celebration of Black History Month in 2021. Each day this February, we'll be looking at and listening to the work of an African American writer whose name may not be as familiar as Frederick Douglass, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, or Toni Morrison. But these writers' contributions help give us a much fuller picture of Black artists' roles in shaping American culture. Episode 25, Akwaeke Amezi. Akwaeke Amezi challenges conventional understanding at every turn in both their personal life and literary career. Amezi chooses to identify with plural and ungendered pronouns, and their debut novel, Freshwater, is a remarkably innovative approach to autobiographical fiction about non-binary gender identity. Emezi is of mixed ethnic ancestry, with an Igbo father from Nigeria and a Tamil mother from India. They lived in Nigeria until emigrating to the United States as a teenager and earning degrees from both NYU and close by at Syracuse University, from which they received their MFA in creative writing. Since their debut in 2018, Amazi has published another new book each year. In addition to another highly regarded novel, The Death of Vivek Oji, that came out in 2020, Amazi also published a young adult novel entitled Pet in 2019, and a memoir of their childhood and adolescence in Nigeria entitled Dear Sentaran, a Black Spirit Memoir in 2021. Their first collection of poetry is slated to be published in 2022. This excerpt from the opening pages of Amazi's debut novel Freshwater introduces the unusual voice that narrates much of the novel. Both the voice's first-person plural self-identification and the subject about which it speaks help set the tone for Amazie's unconventional exploration of the nature of the world and the individuals within it. The first time our mother came for us, we screamed. We were three, and she was a snake, coiled up on the tile in the bathroom, waiting. But we had spent the last few years believing our body, thinking that our mother was someone different, a thin human with rouged cheekbones and large bottle-end glasses. And so we screamed. The demarcations are not that clear when you're new. There was a time before we had a body, when it was still building itself cell by cell inside the thin woman, meticulously producing organs, making systems. We used to flit in and out to see how the fetus was doing, whistling through the water it floated in and harmonizing with the songs the thin woman sang, Catholic hymns from her family, their bodies stored as ashes in the walls of a cathedral in Kuala Lumpur. It amused us to distort the chanting rhythm of the music, to twist it around the fetus till it kicked in glee. Sometimes we left the thin woman's body to float behind her and explore the house she kept, following her through the shell blue walls, watching her as she pressed dough into rounds and chapatis bubbled under her hands. She was small with dark eyes and hair, light brown skin, and her name was Sachi. She'd been born sixth out of eight children on the 11th day of the sixth month in Malacca on the other side of the Indian Ocean. Later, she flew to London and married a man named Saul in a flurry of white sari, veil, and flowers. We came from somewhere. Everything does. When the transition is made from spirit to flesh, the gates are meant to be closed. It's a kindness. It would be cruel not to. Perhaps the gods forgot. They can be absent-minded like that. Not maliciously, at least not usually. But these are gods, after all, and they don't care about what happens to flesh, mostly because it's so slow and boring, unfamiliar and coarse. They don't pay much attention to it except when it's collected, organized, and sold. By the time she, our body, struggled out into the world, slick and louder than a village of storms, the gates were left open. We should have been anchored in her by then, asleep inside her membranes and synced with her mind. That would have been the safest way, but since the gates were open, not closed against remembrance, we became confused. We were at once old and newborn. We were her and yet not. We were not conscious, but we were alive. In fact, the main problem was that we were a distinct we, instead of being fully and just her. For more information about Amazie and their work, click on the link above to visit their personal website. Check back tomorrow at the link at the bottom of the screen for another episode of a deeper dive into African-American literature. While you're there, 
you'll be able to find links to all of the previous episodes in the series, as well as links to booksellers from whom you can purchase these authors' works. And please, if you've enjoyed this series so far, help us spread the word. Thanks and gratitude go out to Clifton Harkham, Jason Hunter, and Alex Jacobs Wilkie at SUNY Potsdam, as well as to David Summerstein and Bonnie North at North Country Public Radio. I can do it. I can do it.